once again for giving us this exclusive, very special interview, like every year after the budget. Uh, through our News 18 network, uh, through CNBC, CNBC Avaaz, uh, CNN News 18, uh, you will be able to reach every nook and corner of the country, and investors are glued into moneycontrol.com, tracking every twist and turn of the budget. Thank you so much. My first question, uh, a somewhat obvious question, uh, no SOPs, no populist measures. Even in 2019 interim budget, the government had announced some SOPs, you know, like tax rebates. There were some announcements for the farmers, but none this time. Uh, seems like a very confident prime minister going into 2024 elections. You've never looked more relaxed to me before. Uh, what was going on in your mind while drafting this? Well, thank you for having me uh, after the budget, like every year. It's a great opportunity to talk to your viewers and also for others who are watching uh, this program more with the keenness to know about the Indian economy. Yes, the budget yesterday did not have any SOPs announced. Um, we treated it like a true vote on account, an interim budget before an election, and also an interim budget which is being presented with the clear understanding that the several programs which were launched with empowerment of citizens in mind over the last 10 years are reaching the ground and the beneficiaries are already on their own speaking about it. The power of word of mouth is very strong. So when a beneficiary gets truly the benefit and without any middleman playing a role in it, they really understand that the intent of the government is what they've said is what is getting executed. So I place a lot of trust in the word of mouth, which has helped in schemes like Ujjwala, PM Avaz Yojana, PM Mudra Yojana, Swanadi Yojana, all of which have benefited the small households, small uh, people who want to do their business and who don't have money to give for collateral, no properties to give. So this government has actually, because of the vision with which Prime Minister is committed to serve this country, is actually serving the common people in letter and spirit. And that is recognized by the people themselves. It's not as if you are saying and you are showing target numbers, you are showing achievement numbers. No. The people in the ground are saying about it. Yes. I've got it. And so is my neighbor. So is the neighbor of that household and so on. So, and that is why I have used an expression, and I mean it when I've said it, that this is secularism in action. This is where we have not shown any difference between members belonging to this community or that community, this religion or that religion, or somebody's relative and not relative. No difference. The project reaches the ground for everybody who deserves to get it. And if they are eligible, they get it, irrespective of who they are. And therefore, in every way, the principle of empowerment, the Sabka Saat, Sabka Vishwa, Sabka uh, Vikas, has been executed in every way. And that is the sense of confidence that the blessings of the people are not just at the time when we gave promises, but the blessings are even now coming in abundantly to say, yes, you've kept up your word. It is what the Prime Minister has also been talking about, the forecasts, as he calls it. That's right. You know, the poor women, farmers, youth. So That's I think right. that is the cornerstone of this part, of this speech. Uh, Nirmalaji, you've steered the economy in difficult times. You know, if I look at your last, uh, last five years, uh, there's been the pandemic. Right now, two wars are going on. Uh, even then, we are projected to grow at 7.3%. Now, if I were to look at the non nominal, nominal GDP, which has grown uh, only 10.5%, uh, consider an inflation of 4, 4.5%, uh, do you think that 7% itself would be challenging? I mean, do you think it is realistic for us to grow on those lines? The chief economic advisor has also commented um, in his uh, preface, he's elaborated on how 7% uh, is not difficult to achieve. 
Um, globally also, the various organizations which look at economies of all countries, like IMF for instance, has also enhanced their own assessment. So, upgrading our growth estimates is not just singularly our business. People are seeing that fundamentally a lot of activities are happening. The robustness of the economy has not slackened anywhere. It has maintained its, you know, the, the, the buoyancy with which things are happening. Not just revenue collection when I'm talking of buoyancy. So, there is reason to believe, yes, it is possible. And the deflator, not just the inflation, but the deflator mm. itself uh, is constantly, meaning we are looking at controlling inflation, the other factors fall in place, so the deflator itself then plays a role. And therefore, uh, we are confident that on the one hand, we'll be able to manage inflation, and on the other, to keep the robustness in growth, so that it is sustained growth. We have made every effort to look at both growth driving elements and inclusivity driving elements so that nobody is left out from this growth process, both to contribute yes. and to gain from. Indeed. Uh, you know, something that has been commented enough uh, and you've got a lot of accolades for it in this budget, uh, if you look at the fiscal glide path, I think you've beaten estimates. Uh, you know, this year you've projected 5.1 next year, so that also looks promising. Uh, what is your message to the sovereign rating agencies? You're expecting an upgrade? Well, I would think that they do their job, but periodically it's our business also to bring it to their notice that economy, particularly emerging market economy like India, Despite the odds, we are doing a lot of reforms, systemic reforms, which actually you are seeing is bearing the results now. If only Prime Minister Modi hadn't pressed the pedal, let's say the revving pedal, the accelerator um, during COVID, even as we are managing COVID, we will have to attend to reforms and continue doing the reforms. The Atma Nirbhar Bharat announcements we're all infused with so much of reform measures. Otherwise, we wouldn't have eliminated more than 68,000 rules, which were just so archaic and were becoming instruments for rent-seeking people. Yes. So, systemic reforms have continued. Whether it was pre-COVID, GST and IBC, together with very many other yes. reforms like professionalizing public sector banks and so on, the emphasis on reform has given us adequate rewards and we'll continue doing that. That is why even in the budget, we have emphasized on transparency. We have emphasized on getting everything on board the budget process itself, rather than keeping it out of, outside of the budget or underneath the carpet. These are not small steps. And that has been consistently done in the last four or five years. And before that, as I said, IBC or banking reforms, the five major uh, you know, recognition hours, as we say, Absolutely. of the problem. So to list it, there are so many, some small, some very big. The small ones having very big uh, um, implication in making the economy much more cleaner and open and transparent. The bigger ones which are bearing results in terms of the money that you collect in GST, yes. these are not uh, small steps. So uh, that is the one which I would play as uh, important indicators which rating agencies should look at comprehensively rather than look at just one detail here, one detail there. Macroeconomic stability is also very well kept up. No, glad you mentioned reforms. I think big message coming from you that the government will con continue on the road Absolutely. for reforms. Uh, you know, what are the, and I've, I've said this to you before, that, you know, uh, cutting the rich tax last year, you know, in an election year, before that, you know, cutting the corporate trade tax. I mean, you've taken some bold measures. What are the next level of reforms that we can expect from, from you? Broadly, I mean, directionally. No, first of all, as I said, the system to become more transparent, more things will have to be done 
in order to make sure that we work together with states. It's one thing for the union government to work on those areas which are exclusively with the central government. But where, uh, where there are overlaps, there are some states which have come about enthusiastically to say, yes, we should benefit also from this vibrancy which results after such uh, measures are taken. And therefore, when reforms are talked about, we normally always say three levels where it has to be carried out with the same vigor. Yes. The central government, the state government, and then the local bodies. Yes. Now, working with the state governments has already started happening. The last few years, you see very many areas where we are working together. The local body level, the municipal urban local bodies, the panchayats, we need to have greater um, interchange of ideas and working together with them also. That will also continue now. Okay. Finance Minister, if I were to ask you this one question, with the exception of Air India, no strategic privatization has taken place, any significant. You know, whether it is IDBI, Concor, uh, SCI, banks. Uh, why, why has your government sort of repeatedly kind of underperformed on this disinvestment aspect? I mean, is the thinking changing within the government? Are you looking at sort of strategic sales and not maybe offer to sell? Uh, completely. Is there some shift in the thinking? I would want you to first of all put that question into the frame that I have laid in the matter of public sector enterprises policy. Okay. If a policy framework has been announced and in that we have said that there are only core strategic sectors which government recognizes where the government will be having a minimal presence. And even in those sectors, private sector will be allowed to, or it will be completely open for them to participate in total. In the sense, there will not be any one sector, inclusive of the core strategic sector, which will be exclusively reserved for public sector, whereby consolidation will have to happen to make them big enough for a big country like India. Efficiencies will have to be brought in their values will have to be increased. So this question of yours will have to fit into that frame. I, I will not reverse any of the cabinet approved decisions. Okay. But at the same time, you should probably also have noticed that for each of them, we are working to make sure, that we are not allowing them to remain there till they are getting disinvested. Equally, we are working to make sure that their valuations are kept up, they are improved upon. That if you look at the public sector listing, listed companies and their valuation in the market today, you see the kind of vibrancy which has been brought in into them, their share values have gone up, the dividends are even much better than earlier. Absolutely. So, disinvestment is one thing, but in bringing value to them, and make sure that the markets look at them absolutely favorably. No, in fact, the public sector companies have done really well, you know, uh, in, and public markets are also where they are. Would you consider sort of diluting your stake maybe to 49% in some of, the, some of the companies, thereby they are not government-owned, but at the same time you have best of both the worlds, of and the valuations is, could go up even further? No, certainly. That is not something which uh, has been uh, uh, denied earlier, meaning as a matter of policy. But in many ways, we are already, you will see periodically, the DPAM yes. uh, department which takes care of the disinvestment has slowly, in trickles, released a lot of government's shares into the market so that private ownerships can come in and they can take hold of those shares. So that is happening already and we will certainly like to make sure that greater participation, public ownership so of In companies like, let's say, SBI or yeah, ONGC, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, th this, this could be another possibility. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, one of the big ideas this budget, which struck to everyone as a big idea, uh, has been the announcement of a corpus of one lakh crore, uh, you know, to provide interest-free or low-interest sort of loans for research and innovation. Can you elaborate a little bit on this? How will this work? Uh, will there be a separate sort of... Uh, entity managing this, how will it, how will it go forward? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I first of all would bring in a bit of a context to, to this. It's not as if we are doing it now for the first time. 
Earlier too, there were several funds within different departments like the science and technology. Um, uh, they had a CSIR, its own. Funds were all over the place. You had them doing supportive activities for innovation, each from their own side. Two years ago, I remember announcing the National Research Foundation, which brought together all these uh, you know, thinly spread resources to one uh, pool, and from there, each of the department would claim whatever they would want to uh, fund in terms of innovation supportive activities. But what we've now done is, they may remain so, but the government would now bring in a kind of a institution or a vehicle which can take this one lakh crore which will be given to them next few years in total uh, as an interest-free corpus amount. Using that, they can then identify innovation-related exercises which are happening in uh, private sector and fund them. I may give this interest-free 50-year loan to the corpus, but the managers of that fund will then decide to whom at what cost should they give it. The cost may vary depending on the risk factors and the judgment of the professionals who will manage it. But it's certainly a fund from where private innovation will be supported. Got it. Uh, I'm sure you'll be asked this question in future, but you know the allocation for CapEx at 11.1 .1 lakh crore, does it seem like a lofty goal considering that you know uh, you could not even do 10 lakh crore uh, in this year? No, but not really. I mean, we, we've done only 2 lakh, 3 lakh. That's not the case. Yeah. We're closer to 10. It's also because absorption has its own limits. Whether it's the states or the departments within Government of India, when the capital expenditure is undertaken through the outlays given to them, it is only that much within 12 months that they can do and not beyond. So sometimes reaching the target, however ambitious it is, is to the last mile difficult within 12 months. Had we given them a few more months, they will probably even complete that. But the condition for these capital expenditure, which I have announced since last two years, three years, is that that amount should be utilized within the year. So many of the state governments which take the money, which are very good in implementing, in fact, I find states very enthusiastic in wanting to avail of this facility. The difficulty comes that if you restrict them to using it within 12 months, and which is what we aim at, we want them to use it within 12 months. So I'm not saying restrict in that sense, but within 12 months when you are expected to spend that money, there are times when completely utilizing it becomes difficult. They partly use it. That is why 10 lakhs you might reach 9, 9.2 and not touch 10, but achieving 9.2 within a matter of 12 is, I think, good enough. So to increase it to 11, I'm very hopeful it will definitely get used. And uh, the amounts which are being given to the states are also having high utilization. Dhrunaji, if I'm right, we get a sense that there is an indication of tapering of government spending. Uh, you know, I know you've, we've discussed this in our last interview as well. Uh, you expect private sector also now to do some heavy lifting. So we, we, are, we are seeing some of, the, you know, some of the sectors looking up now. There are investments in steel, aviation, power, machinery. Some of, but are you happy with, with the level of private sector participation? You said that you know, they are like Hanuman, and Hanuman has no idea of you know, his own power. When do you think that this Hanuman will lift the economy mountain? Well, I think, as you said, they are coming out. There is investment happening. The PIL, uh, no, uh, P, PLI. PIL, PLI scheme is also helping them. Yes. So investments in newer areas do have a slightly longer gestation period. It's not as if their brownfield projects are getting additional money. That also is happening. But the interest in the sunrise sector is really obvious now. People are taking a lot of interest, and you're seeing them coming forward. Okay. Well, that's heartening news. Uh, you know, one, one more question on the stress that is being seen in the rural economy. You know, your higher allocation outlay to Manrega also in, is an indication, betrays, uh, you know, the stress on rural economy. Uh, you know, if you look at the results of FMCG companies, consumer durable companies, uh, you know, 
even if you look at the Nielsen data, it shows that the rural volume growth has underperformed urban volume growth for almost seven quarters now in a row. So what is your prognosis of rural demand and how do you think we will deal with this going forward? I'm not sure if I'll be able to describe how I view uh, what is happening in the rural areas. Let us recognize that there is a lot of shift in the way employment is panning out. Let us recognize that migration is now looking at redefining itself in a way. Many people who went back to their villages with some skills acquired are wondering if they can continue being there and utilizing and benefiting from the skills that they've acquired. Uh, industries too today are allowing a lot of work from home and many who are avoiding traveling are also staying back. So the shift will have to be recognized. But equally, that's not to say people are staying back home without work or staying back and working from there with large companies being established everywhere else. So there is a transition happening undoubtedly. Yes. Second, there's also this little savings which is coming through, which we are seeing from the various fixed deposits which are growing as different from small savings. Yes you're also seeing some middle class looking at savings through the stock markets, DMAT accounts and so on. So the indicators with which we are looking at the rural economy may vary and there are very many newer indicators which we may not want to miss out on. Yes, I agree FMCG uh, market will also tell us that uh, consumable, durable consumables are not being consumed as much as before. Yes. But, well, I take that as one indicator, but equally, the kind of activities which are now happening in the rural areas, because of better connectivity, yes. because of other uh, digitization, are also yet to be measured, I would think. Okay. Uh, one thing related to, you know, the job market, especially, uh, you know, if you look at the campus recruitment in engineering colleges and MBA colleges, so on one side, you know, there is this, uh, the economy is doing well and all, of, all indicators point to that. But on the other hand, you know, the campus recruitment this year has been muted, uh, salaries have been lower, uh, many students have not got a job offer yet. Uh, how do you see this, uh, you know, in relation to the overall big picture? The question about employment, I'm afraid we are repeatedly focusing only on those indicators pertaining to the formal economy, which is important. I am not denying its role. So college recruitments, uh, I am like campuses, are important. But equally, the jobs that are getting created in the middle and lower order, are not getting counted at all. I would look at the way in which banks and their credit offtake is happening. 